Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. I'm Jamie Machik, and I work for the Nicolay Federated Library System. And our system, along with several others, is sponsoring all of these sessions today. We have three down and three to go. Um, if you are just joining us, welcome. If you are hearing me for the fourth time, I'm glad you're still with us. I um, Hopefully you saw the pre-show announcements. If not, we'll be posting alerts in the question box throughout the presentation. Um, our next speaker is Jenica P. Rogers, and she is the Director of Libraries at the State University of New York at Potsdam. And she's going to take questions at the end. And um, so if you do pose a question, um, I am writing it down. Don't think I'm ignoring you. I'm just going to wait till the end to... Um, ask Jenica the questions. Um, while you're here, tell, why don't you tell us where you're from in the, the question box. It's nice to see where people are from, whether it's throughout the state of Wisconsin or uh, throughout the country. I know we have some out-of-staters listening in, too. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Jenica, whenever you are ready. All right. Um, thank you, first off, for inviting me to do this. It's a great opportunity and a lot of fun, actually. Um, I am... Whoops, I'm sorry. There we go. This is me. Um, I always think it's helpful to show who you are when you're doing a webinar, since I'm just going to be a disembodied voice for the next 45 minutes. So this right here is me. Um, lower right is analogous to how I look right now, sitting in my office, except today I'm wearing a white sweater. But upper left is my contribution to the holiday sweater contest, because I have no holiday sweaters, but that's a photo of me wearing a sweater on a holiday, and that should count for something. So envision this woman talking to you. Um, I am the director of libraries at State University of New York at Potsdam, and it, we're a small liberal arts college, 4,000 students or so, and I'm responsible for two libraries, the main library and a music library. Before I get started with actual content, um, all of the photos that I'm using are Creative Commons licensed with attributions and links available on my website. Um, they're currently up as the top post if you go to attemptingelegance.com. And I also have included quotes there, um, links there, because I'll be reading quotes from um, several blogs and using them as I start talking about library self versus library action. So if you are interested in following up with any of those things, please don't feel like you need to scribble anything down because I have all of those links available on my website. So to dive in, let's start here. Um, this is a rhetorical question. But um, how many times have you heard or thought or said, that isn't what libraries do. That just isn't what libraries do. Not everyone thinks that or says it or even means it when they say it. But it's a really easy knee-jerk reaction when we're faced with change. Um, commonly, when we're unsure, um, it's easier to fall back on what we know than to envision what we don't. It's hard to picture a future when you're facing a wall of change that you can't see through. And so we all know some very clear things about what libraries do. And we're all librarians. We've all worked in libraries. We start being indoctrinated into what libraries do during our graduate experiences. Um, our professors tell us what libraries do. Our fellow students tell us what libraries do. Then our supervisors at our internships and our part-time jobs, and then our research and our reading. We learn very clearly and very cleanly what libraries and librarians do. Of course, then we go get our first jobs, and we learn that half of what we just learned in school was wrong. Um, but we also learn that there are other definitions to replace what we're throwing out. We look, toss out the impractical things that we were told, and, and we replace them with our reality. And so our jobs tell us that libraries do this right here, right now, and libraries do not do that right here, right now. And so we begin building our own vocabulary of what libraries do, what librarians do, and we use that as our framework to shape our understanding of our jobs and of our colleagues and, and of our profession as a whole. And so it becomes really easy, too easy, to look at some sort of challenging change and say, but that's not what libraries do. I've heard it, and I've said it, 
And I really think it's the wrong way to start a conversation about change, about identity, and about our services. Um, I have four examples of things that libraries don't do that I think can be helpful to explain why. So first, filling out job applications. Um, I've never lived in Iowa, but I'm going to use an example from Iowa because I heard about it a lot from my friends who do live in Iowa. <laughs> and I used to live in Illinois, so um, Iowa seems nearby even though it no longer is. In 2011, the Iowa State Legislature closed 37 of 55 Iowa workforce development offices. And instead, they explicitly suggested that libraries should pick up the slack in something called the Locally Enhanced Access Point Program. Librarians and the Iowa State Library were understandably concerned, writing formal letters detailing their protests, the impact of that suggestion on their services, and their concerns about the sustainability of it all. The concerns in, detailed on the Iowa State Library website um, were as follows. There's an, this is an excerpt, and I'm quoting. Iowa public libraries are heavily used, and library staff members are very busy. Libraries are concerned that whether they, about whether they have enough staff to provide additional services related to the workforce. Many public libraries have limited space and do not have space for additional online workstations. Iowans using online materials from IWD are likely to need staff assistance. A recent national study about use of Internet computers in public libraries found that 67% of public library computer users ask for assistance. And so, and, end quote. So those are all incredibly valid concerns, and they come to one very pointed and clear conclusion. Providing trained assistance to job seekers, libraries don't do that. Hardball negotiations. Um, we all have relationships with vendors, but when it comes down to hardball negotiations, frankly, we're better at softball. Um, librarians are nice people. We chose a profession in which we serve others intentionally. We chose it intentionally, most of us. Some of us happened into it, but mostly we chose it. And we serve others as part of our mission, as part of what we do every day. And we do it because it has value and because we believe in it. And when we're lucky, we're in a position in which most everyone around us believes in it too. And so we tend to think of all of our network of professional connections as a network of partners who are in this together doing work that has value. We look at other librarians that way. We look at the university as a whole if we work for a university. Um, we look at our, at our city, our town, our community as a part of that network and, and our users. And then we also put our vendors in that relationship. We think of them as partners. And why not? Our vendors fund scholarships, they meet with us regularly, they offer us interesting opportunities to try things, and they create and market and sell the products that our users need. And in some cases, they have the monopoly on access. And to be blunt, you know, it's not our canny sense of self-preservation, assertiveness, and cunning that people think of first when they think of librarians as a whole. So, when we're faced with a difficult business negotiation or complicated financial terms or simply someone whose agenda doesn't seem to line up with ours, we have a profession-wide tendency to give them the benefit of the doubt, to assume that they're a partner, to err on the side of serving the user and getting our users what they want and need, and to agree to sometimes difficult vendor terms because we need what they're selling in order to serve our users. And aggressive negotiations are just not part of the library business model. They're part of a profit-driven business model. And libraries don't do that. Example number three, facilitating naps. Uh, public librarians have great and horrifying stories about um, the homeless, the addicted, or the otherwise disenfranchised citizens using their public facilities as public everything. Um, and I've heard more about human bodily fluids in public libraries than I ever need to hear again. And, and some stories that are much worse and sadder and horrifying. Um, and so I'm not going to touch any of that, since that's not my experience and, and I shouldn't. What I have in my more homogenized academic environment is naps. College students like taking naps. They'll sleep anywhere, they'll sleep everywhere, and I can't think of a campus space in which I haven't seen a student sleeping at one time or another. 
But so here's a story. Um, in 2004 or 2005, somewhere about there, our previous director intended to spend considerable money buying new chairs for our main library, um, upholstered comfy chairs, upgraded comfy chairs. But the question was what kind, what size, what style. So we had our vendors bring in about nine different options. They dropped off samples for us for a few weeks, and we set up a petting zoo for the chairs. Um, students were then asked to try them out and rate them, doing a little survey, and provide any comments they wanted. The one chair that they really unanimously liked, and there was only one that they really unanimously liked. The rest, some people liked some, some people liked others. One chair they really liked was one that folded out and became sort of a lounger. It would be perfect for naps, they said in the comments. And the previous director refused to buy those chairs um, for a variety of reasons that I wasn't fully privy to. Um, so I can't express all of them on her behalf. But the decision turned around on one clear sentiment when we discussed it with each other. Our library is about students' academic success and meeting their information, research, learning needs. And in that context, we will not be prioritizing napping. The subcontext there is naps. Libraries don't do that. And my fourth example is makerspaces. Um, they're a thing. <laughs> they're a thing that is moving its way into libraries. Um, if you don't know much about the makerspace movement, you can Google library makerspace and you'll get a bunch of interesting results talking about participatory learning, innovation, and libraries. And a lot of those will link you to information about 3D printers because, frankly, 3D printing is cool. Um, it's really cool. To dumb it way down for those who don't know about 3D printers, um, and even those who have heard of them but still are a little baffled by them, you give a 3D printer a program, and it uses that programming to print out thin layers of material that, as each layer prints on top of the next one, turn into a 3D object, and you can define all of its parameters. In my personal life, I hang out with an industrial arts, vocational technology, shop teacher, gadgety kind of crowd. And 3D printers are the piece of the future that they're regularly intrigued by as they evolve and develop. Me, I like things like these machines that I pictured here that let you paint eggs. I mean, how pretty is that? <laughs> Check it out. But gadgets like that egg printer and painter, which also takes data and turns it into a thing, it's part of the makerspace discussion. But libraries are getting caught up in the intrigue. And we've seen a recent rush to implementation of 3D printers in libraries, which, probably to no one's surprise, has led to some controversy. Librarian Hugh Rundle um, started a recent discussion with a blog post, and I'm going to quote a bit of what he wrote. Quote, the harsh truth is that there's no business case for public libraries to provide 3D printing. What this is really about is techno lust and the fear of being left behind. How many librarians clamoring for 3D printers currently provide their patrons with laundry facilities? Sawmills? Smelting furnaces? Loans of cars or whiskey stills? I'm guessing none. All these services would be justifiable on the same grounds used to justify 3D printing. Individuals would find the service useful, currently they're expensive to buy or rent commercially, and potentially they could be helpful to productivity in the economy. They are also nothing to do with the core business of libraries." End quote. So that's pretty clear there, that last sentence. They are nothing to do with the core business of libraries. That's very clear. Libraries don't do that. So that isn't what libraries do. I would ask, why not? Um, obviously, not everybody responds with that isn't what libraries do. We all know that no attitude is universally true. But some libraries do respond with, that isn't what we do. You have probably, can probably think of some examples, and I know that I can. Um, but they're part of our professional culture that really presents most often when we're challenged by change. And I think that that reaction is driven in some part by a desire to define ourselves, particularly when faced with change. change pushes at us and pushes at our boundaries, and we feel compelled to push back and declare our own boundaries against that change. But I think that a focus on what libraries do, how libraries act, can damage our brand 
rather than preserve it. It can damage our core identity rather than protect it. Um, here's another quote. This one's from Brian Matthews, who writes a, a blog at the Chronicle of Higher Education. And he wrote, quote, anytime someone uses phrases like mission creep or mission critical to try and squash new ideas, then I know they're stuck in functional fixedness. In this view, the role and operation of libraries fits into a nicely defined box, and trying to rearrange or introduce new components in the box is a challenge, because it doesn't match historical perceptions of excellence." End quote. And boy, do we like excellence. And history is what we have to base it on. And so then we have a box that we're trying to fit ourselves in, because this is what libraries do. And that isn't what libraries do. But I think there's a better way to get to excellence. <clears throat> I think that we should be defining not what we do, but who we are. I think we should be talking about who we are, not what we do and don't do. We may not all have um, librarian trading cards, like the ones in the background here on this image from the Carleton College website. Um, their librarians have these great cards, and they've made a series of them. They describe their attributes. Um, and they describe things that we all know about ourselves, our strengths, our passions, our goals, our identities, our skills. And those cards really encapsulate those and turn them into something a little catchy and really interesting. But I would also say that while we know that about ourselves, we know it about our libraries, too. We know what we're good at, we know what we're motivated by, and we know where we're headed. And some of us know it well enough to lay it out on a business card. But I'd argue that all of us know it well enough to have it be true and authentic and useful to us, but we don't always think about our identity that way when we're focused on what we're doing. Um, we each understand our professional values and our role in our community, but we don't always really look at them when we're fixated on our tasks. So since I've insisted that we all know what these truths are, the question is what are they, right? Who are we? And I think this is easy, and I think that I'm about to lay out a couple things that most people are not going to argue with as being what libraries are about, who librarians are. I explicitly chose photos here that range from the 30s to the 70s. Um, and I did that because I think that these truths about libraries have not changed in recent history. And I think they won't change in the near future. So first among several here, we help people. We always have. And it's been since before my time, it's been since before your time, and it's going to keep going after our time. We help people. We also make information accessible. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a card catalog, an OPAC, a new discovery layer, the open web, a smartphone app, or whatever comes next after our smartphone apps. Those are all different tools, but we're doing the same job. We are making information accessible to people. We also build communities. We have done that through reading rooms, through story time areas. We've done it by offering programming in our institutions. We do it by mimicking living rooms or bookstores or cafes or whatever it is that our unique community needs. But we build communities around our services and our facilities. And we foster creativity and learning. We are sharing not just books, but art, ideas, stories, oral histories, skills, and theories. And we do that so that people can take what they've learned in our libraries and use it somehow. That's part of what we do and part of who we are. So back to those things that libraries don't do, my four examples. Um, if we are professionals who meet information needs with resources, skills assistance, and appropriate infrastructure, and we foster community and community values around information, literacy, and creativity, and we help people, what is it about those things that make them things we don't do? Job applications. Back to the beginning. They really aren't just about filling out paper forms anymore. We all know that. And the Iowa librarians knew that when they objected to those cuts in funding and the transference of responsibility to libraries. They knew what they'd be helping with. 
They knew they would be helping disenfranchised and struggling community members who needed active assistance in navigating online job apps. Not to mention that they were going to be helping people who needed the computer skills that you need to even get to the job ad in the first place. And that's hard work, better suited to the specialized attention of the workforce development offices that were being defunded. And so libraries, we argued, are not the place to learn job skills or get targeted focused assistance with applications. But here's my question. If libraries don't do that, why not? Isn't offering that kind of assistance part of who we are? Doesn't it build community? Doesn't it help people? Do those people not have clear and obvious information needs? When you consider who we are, um, can you really say we shouldn't be doing those things? Example number two. Um, I have serious personal professional issues with this particular library land hesitation uh, about negotiating with our vendors. I spent the last decade working in collection development and library budgeting, and so this issue hits me where I live. When I hear a librarian say she won't reject a bad contract because, and this is a quote, not having the information would be a disservice to our users, end quote, all I can think is, to hell with that, or usually something even less polite. Um, I usually don't say it, mostly just think it. <laughs> and I say, instead, own your responsibilities. Start playing hardball. Start reading contracts. Start questioning the authority that the vendors claim to have over us. Because really, does giving away your money on horrible restrictive deals help people? When our budgets shrink and our costs grow through these awful vendor contracts, does that actually give people enhanced access to information? Is that our idea of excellence? I don't think it should be. Um, and this fall, I took a stand for my institution and refused the American Chemical Society um, package deal that was offered to us because it was simply too expensive. And while it was excellent content, and no one can deny that it's excellent content, content it, it, the cost didn't work for us, um, couldn't work for us. And so I said no. And yes, we have denied access to information to our users. But instead, I have chosen to be more responsible with the budget I have available to me. I have chosen to make sure that I am making smart choices about every contract that we sign with our vendors, not just signing some of them because I don't feel like I have a choice. And so my idea of excellence is to manage that budget with wisdom, not to give away our money on horrible restrictive deals, not to allow vendors to continue to, pre to present us with awful contracts and expect us to smile while we sign them. And it's not just me. Um, ALA President Maureen Sullivan doesn't think so either. Um, January 15th, Yesterday, she sent an email out regarding American Library Association negotiations and discussions with publishers about ebooks. There's the increasing challenge of restrictive deals from publishers, publishers who refuse to work with libraries at all, and they're limiting our market and they're limiting access to our users in dramatic and challenging and hard ways as they try to cope with the new ebook um, landscape and economy. And so to quote Sullivan, um, quote, the principal leverage point, of course, is you. The influence derived from our 58,000 members and the entire library community is powerful. ALA has stepped up its efforts to inform our members and to work collaboratively with our library partners. And then she continues on a bit later, quote, as we start this new year, publisher merger talks are in the news and the landscape continues to shift. We must keep the pressure on large publishers while also deepening existing relationships and building new ones across the ecosystem." End quote. And yes, that's ALA speaking. They're the ones who are going to go straight to the huge publishers and talk with them because they're big and they're supposed to do this stuff on our behalf. But Sullivan's point is actually pretty clear in there. The influence derived from our 58,000 members and the entire library community is powerful. Your voices matter too. The ALA can't stand alone advocating for something that the library community isn't actively supporting. And so I'm not suggesting that we need to enter into adversarial relationships with our vendors, but
but I think that we need to take responsibility for being informed, for being aggressive, and for truly advocating for what our users need. Because whether it's one librarian fighting against a vendor's contract offer, or it's the ALA talking with publishers about the very bad choices they're making right now, we all need to stand up and say that's what has to happen. Because then we'll be taken seriously as partners in this process. So I say, be who we are. Negotiate for a better future for our users and our world. Not do what we do, which is to smile and sign everything. On to something a little bit uh, lighter, naps. <laughs> so when I became director of this library, I bought two of those napping chairs from the previous story. Um, part of my impetus was a survey that we did in 2010 in which we asked a bunch of questions about library spaces and furniture. There was one comment in there, and, and yes, it was one comment, um, but out of many users. And we had several hundred responses to the survey, so yes, one comment, I know. But it really triggered something for me. Sometimes that one voice is all you need to hear. The comment was that there should be more comfy furniture in the library because the student felt safe in the library. And as a commuting student who came to campus in the morning and didn't leave until late at night, sometimes she needed a nice place to relax and maybe take a nap. And the light bulb went on. And I thought, oh, right, community. Um, and we help people. And so in this case, I think we're helping people through safety and a sense of belonging. And I don't think that it's an unfair or sketchy leap to say that we provide access to information when we help people feel safe, feel as though they belong, and feel, therefore, that they can ask questions. Um, part of what we all know about our libraries and our information desks and, our, and the ways that we provide services is that part of what we have to get through is a barrier of expectation and sometimes fear. I don't want to ask for help. I don't know how to ask for help. I can't ask for help because they'll think I'm dumb or they won't want to help me. And so I think that that sense of community, that sense of safety, and that sense of belonging feed directly into who we are. And so, you know, providing a napping chair maybe does um, link directly to who we are. I would also note they're really cool chairs um, in that it folds up and looks just like a regular armchair. But when it unfolds, you see that there's a drawer and a lift on it so that you can put your backpack and your coat and your books into that cubby, and then you lay down on it or sit on it, and no one can get to your stuff. And so the fact that it has those features when it's folded out, I think, just underlines what I ended up deciding, which was that we don't lose anything if we do this. Because yeah, it has those features if it's folded out, but when it's folded up, it's just a chair. It's, just, it's an armchair, you know, with wooden arms and upholstered sides. And so what have we lost if we do this? What value did we compromise by providing this option? Um, is there a core principle that we somehow undermined by offering students a safe place to take a nap in a comfortable surroundings? I don't think that there is. And if you do want to make a slightly sketchy leap and go a little bit further, um, I would say that students who are too tired to stay awake in the library are probably not going to be effective learners. And so if I give them a chance to take a 20-minute cat nap, I may actually be serving their educational needs more effectively than I would otherwise. Um, that's probably never the argument I would directly make as my first line reason for providing this kind of resource. But I don't know. I think it's there. Tired students don't learn very well, sort of like hungry ones don't learn very well. So makerspaces, back to these. <coughs> maybe you're just painting eggs, but maybe you're painting eggs with valuable information, not otherwise easily available. I love the idea of painting nutrition facts onto an egg you know, with that egg bot machine that I showed in the previous slide. I not only think it's hysterical, but um, I think that it's it's one of the coolest examples that I've seen lately of <clears throat> the way that with creative tools you can do interesting things 
with the information that you get from the world. I mean, how cool would it be to be able to get an egg, like a hard-boiled egg in a cafe, and have it have the nutrition facts on it? You know, okay, yeah, I'll put the nutrition facts on a carton of eggs, but when was the last time you got an egg that had your nutrition facts written on it? Without having extraneous packaging, because come on, it's an egg, it's packaged in a shell. So this just tickled me, and I thought that it was just a really interesting image. Um, and I think it represents something very particular, which is that people have always gone and done something with the information that they get from us. In an academic library, the classic is that they do their research and they go write a paper. They produce a paper. Um, but there's more than that. Uh, I also have a music library, so they get information from us and then they go play an instrument or sing a song. In public libraries, they get information from the library and they go fix a toilet or plant a garden, knit a scarf, educate their children, or simply escape into a story land and then write their own stories. Information is so rarely consumed for the sake of just being informed. We take what we learn and we go forth and we do things with it. We apply what we know to our world um, and we make things and do things with what we've investigated and learned and researched and studied. And I'm biased on this in a way and, and I'm very clear about that because as I mentioned, my portfolio of responsibilities includes a music library. We have um, the oldest school of music education in the country and um, if you're in New York and there's a music teacher in your school, there's really good odds they came from the Crane School of Music at SUNY Potsdam. We pride ourselves on that, and as a result, we have a music library to serve those students. And so in the music library, like the main library, we, we have books and we have journals on history, theory, composition, but we also have scores and sound recordings over there. And we have computers there because they're a modern university library and you need to have a computer lab, and so we do. But those computers also have piano-style keyboards attached to them. And we have um, study tables and computers and comfy chairs and couches, as we do here in the main library. But we also have listening rooms with stereo equipment and the jazz improv lab is attached to the facility. So, Music students who take our scores and our sound recordings and then use instruments to create music with the information that they're get, getting from our library collections are the very clear middle step in my mind between the average student in my library who does research and creates something by writing a paper and the library user who gathers information and then creates something by constructing something in a makerspace using a 3D printer or an egg box or whatever else might be found in that space. It just means that makerspaces make sense to me. Um, to even a little bit broader with an example of my camp from my campus, we were an arts campus in a large sense, not just our school of, of music and the music education programs, but we have good fine arts and creative arts programs as well. Um, creative and performing. And so when we sat down with the art department to talk about journals, because there isn't an academic library in, on, in the country that isn't talking with faculty about journals, because print journals just don't get used the way they used to, but they're a deeply held part of what libraries do. Um, so we have to have these conversations as we try to shift and, and bend and, and move. And the art faculty wanted to have print journals not because they cared deeply about the articles for research purposes, but because they cared about exposing their students to the imagery, to the new art, to the retrospectives, to all of those quality images found in their magazines, trade magazines and journals that could inspire their students to go back to their studios and create something. So a piece of my brain says, well, they could do that here, couldn't they? Could we do that here? Maybe we could do that here. How would we do that here? And I haven't really answered the how would we do that here question, but it seems a very logical continuum. If we com provide computer labs and writing tutors and research one-on-one -on -one research assistants to students who are attempting to write papers, what kind of resources can we provide for students who need to go make a painting? Um, because we learn things 
and then we do things based on what we've learned. We take the information in our world and we apply it. Why not do that in the library? What about the library as a concept is harmed if we also include spaces for creation with what we learn there? Why don't we do that? Isn't that who we are? So, and, and beyond those questions, just an edge beyond the doing and the making, um, I would like to quote the librarian Andromeda Yelton who wrote on her blog, quote, Community publishing is a great thing some libraries are cultivating, but you need not create books in order to be deeply, transformatively engaged by them. Same thing with 3D printers, or whatever other tools you've got for letting the light in, provoking exploratory dialogue inside people between now and elsewhere, literal and possible, self and other, here and there." End quote. So Andromeda is positing, and I agree, that there's a value in seeing new tools and new ideas in action and in knowing through experience that something's possible, and for opening our minds to what could come next once you've seen what's new. And so isn't that also a part of what libraries are? A place and a community that opens up our worlds to something more than we had before we walked through the door? Seems to me that that's a core, key part of who and how and why we have libraries. Um, opening people's worlds to something they wouldn't have access to before. Information, knowledge, learning. We foster creativity and learning. We build community. We help people. And we provide access to resources that involve, require, and generate information. I think that it can be bigger than we provide access to information. So, that isn't what libraries do. I repeat, why not? I would ask that the next time you hear this, um, the next time someone says that isn't what libraries do, I invite you to interrogate the question in return and ask, why not? <laughs> why isn't it what libraries do? Because maybe it is something libraries can do. Because maybe it's actually a part of who we are to do those things. And we just need to redefine what libraries do based on who we are. So let me requote Brian Matthews. Anytime someone uses phrases like mission creep or mission critical to try and squash new ideas, then I know they're stuck in functional fixedness. In this view, the role and operation of libraries fits into a nicely defined box and trying to rearrange or introduce new components in the box is a challenge because it doesn't match historical perceptions of excellence. And so then there's a quote from David Lankes at the um, Syracuse University iSchool that expands on that idea very nicely. Um, quote, some librarian brought the first printed book into the library, and another brought the first microfiche reader. Some librarian brought in the first game, and the first scroll, and the first illuminated manuscript. They did this to enhance access, yes, but also to expand the capabilities of the communities they served. They did so not because it was text and therefore it was okay, but because they were tools that could help. Help not document the world, but to change it. Librarians change the world. Librarians are radical, positive change agents that work with their community, sometimes following, but often provoking and pushing. A good librarian challenges what could be, not simply reifies what is." End quote. So I say, building on those thoughts, that if you know who you are and ignore what you do for a minute in your attempt to define yourself in your library, then you're leaving yourself open to new positive change. If you focus on what you do, you limit and box in what might be. And I think we'll all be able better to protect, evolve, and, and nurture our libraries into the future if we're focused on who we are and not on what we do. The doing is very limiting. The self is really, really expanding. And so that's a kind of fuzzy statement that I just made. Um, and I always try to swing back around from fuzzy statements to something really concrete. So. Um, I'm going to tell you another story. <laughs> I live in Potsdam, New York, and so yes, I am at a university and we do have 4,000 students here, but it's also a small town. Um, this is rural New York, 
upstate New York is, uh, St. Lawrence County, where I'm located, is the largest geographical county in New York, but the least populous. And um, my father, who grew up in, uh, in New England and upstate New York, but then spent most of his adult life in northern Illinois, always said that vacationing in northern Wisconsin made him feel like he was going home, because northern Wisconsin and upstate New York are really pretty similar. So uh, think, of, think of the parts of your state that you know when you think of my little story here. So I live in a small town, uh, 8,000 people, 10,000, something like that. And in the middle of nowhere, we have no big cities anywhere near us, several hour drive to get to anything. And we have a public library, and I love my public library. They are lovely people trying to do very good work with limited resources in a historically charming but sort of impractical old building. And they have a very diverse community that needs their service. Um, they have college professors, and they have um, everyone else in the community on top of that. Um, ranging from the Amish to farmers to the mechanics and the restaurant owners and the small business owners. Um, it's a big, broad swath of humanity to try to help. I mean, seriously, think about an anthropology professor and the Amish both frequenting your library. Not hard or anything. Um, but, so, one of the things that they do that I recently discovered is that they have a book delivery service for um, homebound elderly users. And they don't have enough resources to have an actual bookmobile that de delivers to people. I mean, bookmobiles are resource hogs. There's, they're, they're actually unsustainable for most modern libraries. But they do a delivery service for the major senior centers and apartment complexes that serve our local seniors who may not be able to get out to get materials. And they deliver to them on set days at set times. And they have a staff member who drives around in her car then does that. And you could potentially say that in a, a library, a small library with limited resources in a community with so many needs, that could be potentially a waste of resources, not their mission. It's really easy to say that is not the kind of thing that we do. But if you go to their website and you look at their mission statement, which is clearly and prominently posted there, it says that the Potsdam Public Library is the community's guide on the path to lifelong learning. And if you accept that the community includes all those people and that lifelong learning does in fact include the later parts of life, not just the early parts, then having homebound book delivery helps people, provides them with access to information, builds community, and inspires creativity and learning. And so their priorities shifted to make that part of what they do. So I suspect that our arguments about we don't do that are more often than not about fear and challenge rather than about confident awareness of our identity and our mission. We don't do workforce development because we're afraid it'll take away from our other user needs. We don't do negotiations because we don't know how, and it seems uncivil. We don't do naps because it's not respectable, and it'll ruin our image as serious academic business. We don't do makerspaces because making things distracts us from the pure information tasks of our work. But what if your priorities and resources were aligned towards those things because they made sense when they were considered through your self-identity, through your library's identity, and through your mission? What if your understanding of your mission allowed you that space? Um, what if your awareness of who you are and why you do what you do opened you up to doing challenging things instead of closing you down to doing obvious ones? And so what if you made decisions about priorities based not on what we don't do, but on what we could be? So I would ask that everyone think about what your library's mission statement says. Does it say the right things? Does it say helpful things? Does it say accurate things? <laughs> and does it tell you who you are? Or does it tell you what you do? And if as you look at those things and see that it doesn't work for you, then fix it. Make it right. Make it better. Make it work. Make it your own. 
I think that it's the wrong answer to tell librarians that we don't do that because libraries are things that fit into neatly defined boxes. Your libraries are all different from mine and they're all different from each other's um, and those differences matter because they're based on our missions, they're based on our community needs, they're based on our goals, they're based on who we are and who we have been and who we want to be. They need to be different from each other and trying to shove them into these boxes that defined past excellence is just going to prevent us from finding our own unique excellences in the future. So I really, I encourage you to understand who you are and what your mission is. And then go live it, bravely. Because nobody can tell you you're doing it wrong, because you are unique, your institution is unique, and your library is unique. And you get to define what success looks like. And that is the end of my prepared remarks. Thank you. But I'd be happy to take questions. All right. Thank you, Jenica. Uh, we had a few come in. And if you can think of something to ask Jenica, again, uh, use the uh, question box. Um, Mariel said, yes, we want to help people and build community. But how do we do that with no staff increases and uh, very little resources ourselves? And maybe that's the million dollar question in all libraries. <laughs> I'm not sure. It totally is a million-dollar <laughs> question in all libraries. Um, and I don't have an easy answer, but I do have a fast one, which is that when you're faced with no resources, no staff, and not nearly the support that you need, then you have to look at what's most important. What is the most important priority for you and for your institution? Um, we are, in my experience, terrible at stopping things. We're really good at coming up with new ideas. Like, we're really good at coming up with new ideas. We are not so great at implementing new ideas. And when we implement new ideas, we very rarely cease to do something else. And so we just come up with a great new idea and add to our responsibilities rather than come up with a great new idea and replace something. Why do you think that is? Why do you, why do you think, as a profession, we're not good at the implementation? What, um, what's the barrier there? Well, I'm, the I'm asking your opinion. So. Yeah, yeah. I think the barrier to giving <laughs> things up is that um, somebody always likes every service we've got going. There isn't a library out there that has a service that we do that no one likes. There's always somebody who thinks it's the perfect thing. So whenever we stop doing something, we're going to disappoint someone. And that's hard. Okay. It's hard to do. Um, we, we like helping people. And so even if there are 10 users who benefit from this thing that we do, we will give that time to make that happen. But sometimes you have to say that there is a greater good to be served by making a hard choice. Um, and that's not our favorite position to stand in. Uh, a lot of people asked where you got the napping chair. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, it's hospital furniture. Um, so that was from a local hospital then? No, we, we have a furniture guy, actually. Um, it's the, the company is W.B. Mason, and they're located in Plattsburgh, New York, um, and they may be in Vermont as well. I have no idea if they do national work or not, but it's a furniture broker, and so they work with the big furniture companies, and, they bring a, and our guy brings us catalogs and makes suggestions about what has worked at other academic libraries he's worked with. But he brought us that after a conversation with our facilities director and said, this is hospital furniture. Um, this is what they sell to hospitals, because people who make industrial furniture for libraries also have other markets. Um, and so in hospitals, you know, they have the double-wide chairs that recline, and that's what that is. Excellent. Um, someone really cool. <laughs> <laughs> they look really awesome. I think we all want one in our office or in our libraries or maybe at our her homes or something. Well, um, we had a staff member who was injured this summer. Um, she had a shoulder, a severe shoulder injury, and we, we offered it to her and said that if that would help her be more comfortable in her office, she could uh, have it this summer. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, someone asked, um, so, and maybe this could be part of a broader question, you know, for something like the nap chair, um, you, you know, you might get people or you might, you know, you might get patrons or staff members or even board members asking, you know, what do you, what do you do about disinfection or what do you what do you do about that? So how 
how do you best tackle those types of things when 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 you're asking the why not or right. you know like why aren't we doing that um, I what's the best I approach I think that it's really important to draw a line in your own mind when you're assessing something to draw a line between two different places. And on the one hand, you want to gather all the input you can and think about as many of the hard, complex questions as possible because you want to be prepared for if something went wrong or maybe this isn't a good idea and we should rethink. So you want to be thoughtful and attentive to as much of the information that's out there as possible. Concerns about the chairs are going to get gross, and um, you know we can't we can't do that because there's a safety concern, or if we do that, it's going to cost too much money. You need to gather all that information, and you need to honor it, and you need to pay attention to it. But then you need to draw a line, and you only let certain things onto the other side of that line because the other side of the line is things that are important enough to stop us from making this decision. And I think that it's often really challenging to figure out which pieces of information you move across that line. Because you need to gather all the feedback, and you need to think about all the challenges. But not all of the challenges that are identified are important enough, are mission critical enough, to stop you from trying something. And I think that we have a tendency that if anyone voices an objection or a concern, to treat that as though it is absolutely mission critical and so now we cannot do this because someone said there might be a problem. Sometimes someone says there might be a problem and you think about it and you think to yourself, can I handle that problem? And then you move ahead. Mm. And, and that's been my very important deciding factor is, is this something that's good to know and should be discussed or is this something that is a real problem that we have to solve before we can move forward? That's a um, good point to that. Um, someone asked what happened with the ACS contract and if you got any results from the vendor. <laughs> uh, you can Google Jenica Rogers and the American Chemical Society and get more information than you ever wanted. But I will gladly give you the very short summary, which is that we do not have an ACS contract. Um, we, I, I discussed pricing with our sales representative privately about a year ago, and then Last April, I met with some other SUNY library directors and some of our central administration and several very highly placed American Chemical Society sales representatives, and we, we discussed our pricing issues for seven hours. Wow. And we had no middle ground. Um, they have a very logical, functional um, price increment step system where they take the different factors and apply an increase to their base price based on what kind of library you are. The problem is that their base price is so high, it's absolutely unsupportable for libraries like mine. And so I made the difficult choice to work with our chemistry faculty who really need that information. It's the best stuff. And to come up with some creative workarounds to, to try to get them chemical information without having to sacrifice what came to 11% of my materials budget on one department's journals. And then I wrote about it on my blog, and then it kind of went viral. Um, and got, I got interviewed by the Chronicle of Higher Education. I got badmouthed in the press by the American Chemical Society. Oh, no. And um, it's been really interesting. <laughs> and I've had several libraries tell me that they've also canceled their package. Um, and the National Library Consortium of France has ceased negotiating with the American Chemical Society, as has oh, wow. Canada. So there's definitely a moment here about the pricing of scientific information for libraries. I don't know where it's going. Um, Meredith made a comment, um, and she said, I completely agree about student snapping in libraries. Um, I know this is allowed and even embraced at my daughter's um, school in La Crosse. Um, she said it's not so much students at her small public library. They have a, a lot of times they have a few older gentlemen who fall asleep over their book or newspaper fairly often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you consider that libraries are part of our community, whatever your community is, you know, that's a really broad group. And I really do come to the question of what, what are we losing if we facilitate this? But what do you say to the person, I'm just going to play devil's advocate here for a second, what do you say to the, the, pe the community member who says, well, libraries are for, and I've heard this, um, reading, studying, and research? 
um, I would say that that is absolutely true. Those are things that libraries are for, <laughs> but we're more than that. Um, and I would also say that I believe that a library is defined and its purpose and its utility and its value are defined in part by its users and the way that they choose to use the space in pursuit of their success. Um, and some of them want to sit and work on a group project in a corner and they never touch library materials, but they needed a big table with a computer on it. And so that's not reading and it's not studying, um, but it's definitely learning. And so I am very hesitant to tell my community of users that they are doing their life wrong and that they are my partners in defining what a modern academic library is and looks like. That is a great answer <laughs> to that question. Um, last question I have for you that I've been asking all of the speakers is, so where do you see libraries at uh, 10 years from now? Um, maybe you want to focus on academics since that's um, where you are at. Where, what do you see them looking like? What do you see changing? I see them being far less collection-based. Um, in terms of our print resources. I think that we're going to continue to shrink our print collections. I don't think they're going to go away. I, I'm not one of those people who says that print is dead. Um, I think that there is value in our printed history and our printed knowledge, but I think that the amount of space that we chose to dedicate to our print collections is going to decrease in many academic libraries. Um, because what I am seeing, not just here, but in many places, is the growth of collaboration and the growth of um, inspiration through groups. I don't know quite how to phrase it, but the liveliest part of our library is the not silent collaborative spaces, and they are amazing to walk through. They're incredibly energizing to watch our students work together in those spaces we've given them that they can, you know, they have some agency over them. The furniture moves around, the chairs move, they've got computers, they've got whiteboards, they can do whatever it is that, that really works for them. And watching them define this as a space for learning um, has been really great. And I think that that is the thing that I know I want to foster because it seems to be the most important and, and energizing thing about our libraries right now. And so I think that really is part of the direction that we're moving in. Specifically in academia, um, I think that we need to move our, to position ourselves not as those people who sit behind desks and help you look stuff up in books, but as um, partners in understanding how to find information, how to search, how to get stuff. Um, because the instant that a student sits down and has a one-on-one -on -one interaction with a librarian who helps them move through their homework process, they, come, they, they are, become loyal friends and they come back over and over again. Um, and so I don't think that my vision of a library for 10 years from now has any less um, value and importance on the one-to-one -one connections that we make with our users, but I think we may see them happening in very different ways. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jenica, for sharing your expertise, and you gave all of us a lot of food for thought. Um, our next session is at, what time is it, 2 o'clock? Our next session is at 2.30 uh, with Sarah Houghton, and um, hopefully I will see a lot of you then. And uh, we'll probably have some new people joining us. So again, thank you, Jenica. Thank you, uh, participants. And um, we will talk to you in about 30 minutes. Thank you.